always be in the open door and whatever when it is in the middle of the hell 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 of the It's time. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Game Theory, where good things, or at least FNAF things, come to those who wait. And man, when it comes to this game series, no one was waiting for anything. I mean, the second game came out three months after the first, the trailer for the third was two months later, and like four minutes after that, the game was available to download. So forgive me if I was caught with my pants down on that one. I just wasn't prepared for it. But even more impressive than that abbreviated timeline was your ability to rip that final game apart. Hours after the release of the game, people were discussing good versus bad endings, 8-bit Atari cake, glitching through walls, and punching a flipping code into cement bricks arranged like a telephone dial pad. In regards to that last one, I have two things to say. First off, well done to you guys for figuring it out so quickly, and secondly, Scott, seriously. Seriously, Scott? Oh look, here's a wall. Let me just dial in my phone number. Beep boop boop beep boop boop. What? When did we jump from a point and click horror game to magical fantasy? This thing is like platform nine and three quarters. I expect Harry F and Potter to apparate into Pirate's Cove or something. Jeez. Here I was thinking that you'd plug your numbers into, hmm, the one other place that you see numbers in this game, the bonus jump scare menu, or something, anything. But nope, dialing it into a wall makes so much more sense. <sighs> okay. Sorry, just needed to get that one off my chest. Moving on. Now, with 15 days at Freddy's under our belts and a few overtime hours clocked in for good measure, we have ourselves a completed video game trilogy with the third game giving us more jump scares, more phone guy, and more... Fan. But this game also contains the final clues we need to get some closure on this game's deviously vague story. Scotty C certainly didn't make things any easier for us, but at this point I think we finally have enough puzzle pieces scattered across the three games to assemble a fairly accurate picture of this franchise's lore. Since you guys had a, let's just say, above average interest in this theory, I wanted to create something that answered as many questions as possible about this franchise. But beyond just the details, the question we all want an answer to is what exactly happened in the story throughout this series? It's a pretty fundamental question to not have an answer to, and yet, despite thousands of videos, forum entries, and Tumblr posts, whoa, whoa, hey, put that away, you behave yourself. This game is already scary enough without you sticking your hook somewhere it doesn't belong, okay? Despite all those things, we still don't have a clear picture on the details. Yes, there's a child killer on the loose, the infamous purple guy, who's been using Fazbear pizzerias as his hunting ground of choice for years, but going into the third game, we still weren't sure about who this guy was or even how many victims he'd officially taken. Then there are the animatronics. Sure, we generally understand that the killer's dead bodies have been stuffed into some of the suits and that with the help of the puppet, the kids were able to find new life in those robotic bodies, but then what about Shadow Bonnie and Shadow Freddy, who randomly appeared in FNAF 2 only to become prominent figures throughout part Part 3. How do they fit in? What about the ghostly Golden Freddy? Someone we've been talking about since the first game, and yet we still don't really know anything about him. Well, now that we finally have all the facts, I think it's time we revisit my timeline I presented in the last episode to see what I got right, what I got wrong. <laughs> yes, you heard that. Wrong. No shame. I'm a big boy. Mommy wow, I'm a big kid now. And finally fill in the missing details to create what I believe to be my definitive Five Nights theory. And boy howdy, it is a doozy. So strap in, theorists. You wanted it, you're about to get it. Overall, the timeline of the franchise I presented the last video still holds strong. Decades before the name became a horror legend meriting its own theme park style attraction, Freddy Fazbear got a start at 
Fredbear Family Diner. It's here where our story begins as Purple Guy takes his first victim, something we see in the Take Cake minigame from Five Nights at Freddy's 2. What tells us that this is Fredbear's and first in the timeline? Well, as I said last time, in addition to it being a small space, the only character we see is Freddy, whereas all other minigames feature multiple animatronics. He's also holding a cupcake. Since that would later become Chica's signature item, the event depicted in this game must have come before she was created. Additionally, notice that the purple guy's murder takes place outside the building. This is the only time we see him murder someone outside the walls of a Fazbear building, which implies that this is likely his first victim. Serial killers often have what's known as a signature, a way of killing that's unique to him and him alone. For purple guy, his signature is dressing in an animatronic costume, then luring children to the back of the pizzeria and killing them there. But this murder occurs before he developed this particular style, implying that it's the first. From there, we know that the puppet jump scare that always follows this minigame, combined with the tear design on both the dead child and the puppet's mask, implies that the soul of the first child now exists in the puppet. The event caused the original owners to sell the Fredbear name, who then rebranded and avoided the negative PR, becoming what we know today as Fazbear Entertainment. They then opened a new chain of restaurants, which we never saw in the games, until the release of Five Nights 3. This is not Fredbear Diner like many interpret, but rather the first location of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, predating the events of Five Nights at Freddy's 2. How do we know? Well, by paying close attention to the old recordings of Phone Guy dug up in FNAF 3, he introduces us to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, not Diner, before explaining the functionality of the special Springlock suits. Uh, welcome to your new career as a performer slash entertainer for Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Right now, we have two specially designed suits that double as both animatronic and suit. He also lets us know that the animatronics are still allowed to walk around freely during the day, meaning that this is happening before the Bite of 87, in which an animatronic bites someone during business hours, removing their frontal lobe, and resulting in the animatronics being restricted to moving around only at night. For ease of operation, the animatronics are set to turn and walk toward sound ease. As Phone Guy informs us, and as we see in the Stage 01 minigame, there are two specialty suits, a Golden Bonnie suit and the origins of the infamous Golden Freddy. But the lifespan of these Springlock suits is actually short-lived as we learn about their one fatal flaw. After learning of an unfortunate incident at the sister location involving multiple and simultaneous Springlock failures, the company has deemed the suit temporarily unfit for employees. The classic suits are being retired, an appropriate location. Now, let's pause here. Two employees are killed by the failure of a Bonnie suit and a Freddy suit. Where else in the game do we see Bonnie and Freddy sharing a unique feature that no one else in the game possesses? Shadow Freddy and Shadow Bonnie. Could this be the origin of the paranormal Shadow suits? Yes, actually. Shadow Freddy and Shadow Bonnie are tied to the ghosts of the employees who died in the spring suits. Get this, the employees' bodies were taken out of the suits, which is why their appearance is more paranormal and why they can't possess them as well as the children can. Plus, having this as their origin would explain the in-game behavior of both suits. In FNAF 3, we see that Purple Guy hides in a secret safe room that has been built into every pizzeria, a room that's hidden to customers and invisible to the animatronics programming. During the minigames that occur between nights, we see Shadow Freddy lead the other animatronics to this secret room, only to cause them to glitch out and then get torn apart by Purple Guy. This suit Supernatural origin story is how Shadow Freddy is able to enter the safe room when other animatronics can't. How he's able to lead you to that room in the first place when other animatronics wouldn't be able to see it based on their programming, and even why he leads you there, knowing that purple guy attacking you will eventually free your soul. That's also why there's no purple Freddy suit when you do finally enter that room. It's not an alternate purple guy costume like many believe, it's an apparition. Suck on that, Harry Potter, I knew someone would apparate eventually. It also explains why Shadow Bonnie's minigame in FNAF 3 always starts on stage 01, the spring suits, and why it's the one animatronic we control that has the ghostly ability to glitch, fly, and teleport. As we concluded last episode, this is also the point in the timeline of the first missing children's incident, the one we learn about via newspaper clippings in Five Nights 1. So, based on the newspaper clipping evidence we have, we know that the mauve murderer dressed in one of the suits lured children to a back room and killed them. 
them. He's starting to develop his signature. But one nagging detail FNAF theorists have been wondering is what suit does he use for his disguise? The answer? Golden Bonnie. Why? Well, remember the phone guy saying the faulty suits were being retired to an appropriate location. There's a high likelihood they're being stored in one of the safe rooms in the restaurants. Plus, we hear in FNAF 2 that the purple guy has a habit of using a yellow suit. We had a spare in the back, a yellow one. Someone used it. But why not Golden Freddy? Phone Guy tells us so at the beginning of Night 5 in FNAF 3. Management has also been made aware that the Spring Bonnie animatronic has been noticeably moved. My, what an oddly specific detail to include, Scott Cawthon. And remember, these tapes that play in FNAF 3 date all the way back to the first pizzeria location, which is why this detail is so important. It reflects Purple Guy starting to develop his signature killing pattern. From there, we know the rest of the story. Purple Guy kills the kids, stuffs the bodies into the suits to hide them, but as we read the paper, is caught on camera and arrested. Meanwhile, the puppet gives life to the children, and the angry spirits possess the robots. Or is that really how it goes? Let's go back to the Give Gifts, Give Life minigame. The children are lying there dead, and the puppet first tries to give them presents. Weird, right? Weird until you consider that his place is at the prize corner. Giving presents is the only thing he knows that can make children happy. It's a reflex. Remember, this is still a child spirit in this puppet, but when that doesn't work, the puppet goes around one more time and does the only other thing it can think of. Put the bodies into the suits. You heard that right. In trying to save the children, he's the one hiding them in the animatronic suits. Not the killer like we've been assuming. But then what about the fifth child, as there's only four here? Well, as we pointed out last time, the fifth child is there too, appearing at the very end of the mini game and taking the role of Golden Freddy. But remember, Golden Freddy is a decommissioned Springlock suit at this point, deemed too unsafe to be functional. The reason he's slumped over and can't move like the rest is that his endoskeleton has been taken out. He's in suit mode, not free roaming mode. He physically doesn't have the mechanisms in place to stand up and move. Possessed or no, a dead child's spirit just can't give a boneless suit the ability to stand. This also explains the lone, naked endoskeleton that appears occasionally in both Five Nights 2 and Five Nights 1. An endoskeleton that once belonged to Golden Freddy. Whew. I know I made you wait for this one, so I knew I had to make it count. <laughs> Heck, if there ain't a lot to cover. Still with me? Good, because we're ready for our next location. You see, since the puppet hid the bodies, no one knows they're in the suits until they start oozing and smelling, which, as we see in the papers, eventually gets the place shut down for health violations. The company tries to recover from, quote, the tragedy that took place there many years ago, but can't, and eventually is forced to shut its doors for good. This leads to the trailer for Five Nights at Freddy's 2. Finally, we're actually going to talk about a game in the series. Seriously, can you believe we've been going this whole time on locations that aren't even settings for the three main games? That is why this lore is so challenging, but also so interesting. Anyway, forgotten, dismantled, deactivated. These are the words you see at the beginning of the trailer. Back when the debate about whether this game was a sequel or a prequel to the first game, these words made it seem like a follow-up, that everything had been shut down since the first game, but it wasn't. These words are a reference to the business being closed down after that first missing children's incident. That's why posters everywhere in Five Nights 2 are all about the brand new Fazbear Pizza. It's the grand reopening after years of being out of business. That's also why the new toy animatronics have built-in facial recognition software to a criminal database. They need to be careful to prevent another incident. But, as we know, it doesn't work. As we see in the Save Them minigame, five more children get killed in this new location. We know it's the new location because the minigame map's layout perfectly matches this new Fazbear business. We also know it couldn't have happened earlier in the timeline as both the old animatronics and new toy robots are presented in the game. But this time, the puppet's solution isn't saving the kids, it's stopping the killer. He enlists the help of Freddy to try and S.A. V-E-T-E 
T-H-E-M, leading the bear to the killer's location. Except Purple Guy came prepared, equipped with not a phone, but rather something to help him tamper with the animatronics. He knows that something fishy is going on with these robots, cause he's been watching, studying. The puppet wants Freddy to save them, to which the killer's answer is only this. You can't. So how did the purple guy manage it when he had been caught years before? What about the bite of 87? How do FNAF 1 and 3 fit in? And most importantly of all, who is the purple guy? All that next week. Don't worry, I'll come back. I always do. In the meantime, it's all just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Make sure you don't miss part two by clicking subscribe. Well, honestly, you still might miss it. The subscribe button is really just a glorified bookmark button. But still, it's the best you're gonna get, so might as well do it. And while you're at it, you know what else you should click on? The link in the description for some free food delivered straight to your door, courtesy of Naturebox. Honestly, I love this service. Naturebox delivers boxes of snacks straight to your door. It's like having a year-long Santa Claus giving you tasty presents. Or like those care packages your parents send you when you're away in school. It's awesome, and it's free if you go to naturebox.com slash matpat or click that link. They have over a hundred snacks to choose from. Even as I write, I'm munching on some lemon tea biscuits and strawberry figgy bars. Seriously, look, here they are, so you know it's something I'm using myself. Anyway, it's free food that doesn't require you to leave your couch or break your game theory marathon. Sounds like a win-win to me, so check out naturebox.com slash matpat and start snacking.